Hey, my name is Chantal Farmer. I'm a research scientist with uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at the Sherbrooke Research and Development Centre. And I've been working there for a good 35 years, looking at sow lactation biology, trying to increase milk production in sows and increasing growth rate of piglets. So today it's a real pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss with you the essential role of the sow for piglet performance. What I want to cover, first I will talk about colostrum. What is the composition of colostrum compared to milk? What are its main roles for piglets? What are the yields of colostrum that we can expect? In this presentation, I will not discuss composition. We don't have time. I will focus on the amount of colostrum produced. Then I will look at different factors of variation of this amount of colostrum that is produced, whether they're animal characteristics, hormonal status, or I will talk also about a project to prolong this phase where the colostrum is produced using oxytocin. Then I will move on shortly to discuss a little bit milk production by sows. Why do we want to maximize milk yield of sows? Mammary important. Is it important? If so, when does it take place? What are the factors of variation? And then I will cover two projects on the effect of T2s in parity one and milk yield in parity two. And obviously, end with short conclusions. So let's start at the beginning. Composition of colostrum. You can see here colostrum from zero to 24 hours. Then you move on to transition milk from 36 to 72 hours. And at the end you have, after that, you have milk. A major difference that you can see in terms of composition is mainly in terms of protein content. And this is nothing new to anyone here. Protein content drastically decreases between colostrum and milk. And that means that immunoglobulins, and here you see immunoglobulin G, more specifically, decreases also very much between colostrum and milk. Other components are also altered, dry matter, in fact, fat, lactose, and energy are greater in milk than colostrum. But the most important characteristics are the protein and IgG contents that are greater in colostrum. Newborn piglets are very vulnerable. Everybody knows that. They have very low energy reserves, only 1% of body fat. They have a low metabolic rate, no immune protection. They're really not doing so good at birth. So we have to help them. What is helping them? It's the colostrum from the sow. This colostrum is essential to provide the piglet with energy, to activate its own heat production, also to provide the piglet with passive immunity, mainly in the form of IgG, and also provide growth factors such as IgF1, EGF, transforming growth factor beta. And these growth factors are important for the development and the maturation of the gastrointestinal tract of the baby pig. Another important role of colostrum is to provide bioactive components that will be useful later on for the development of certain organs. And this is called the maternal lactocrine programming. And an example of this is the hormone relaxin, which is present in the colostrum and is important to affect the development of the uterus when the animal reaches puberty. So colostrum is not only important for immunity, it's also important for a lot of developmental processes in the piglet. We know that the ingestion of 250 grams of colostrum by a piglet of average body weight will greatly reduce the risk of preweaning mortality, will provide a source of passive immunity, and will allow for body weight gain of those piglets. If a piglet is not um, consuming 250 grams of colostrum, it will not be able to gain weight. So if you look at a litter of 13 piglets, it means that the sow will need to produce 3.3 kilograms of colostrum. And in a study done by Hélène Canel in 2012, she showed that a third of the sows did not have enough colostrum to meet the need of the piglets. So we have a problem. Sows are not producing enough colostrum to meet the needs of all their piglets. This amount of colostrum produced is very variable. It can range between 1.9 to 5.3 kilogram in that 24 hour period. And it averages about 3.5, 3.6 kilo in most studies. 
Now, what is it affected by? This, does the sow affect colostrum yield? And the answer is yes. Uh, and one very important point is that the amount of colostrum that the piglet will ingest in the first 24 hours after birth will be greater if the piglet is bottle fed, so more than 450 grams per kilogram of body weight, if the piglet is bottle fed, so on top of the milk from the sow, it's getting milk from a bottle. And if the piglet is only suckling its own dam, it will ingest between 200 and 373 grams per kilo. What is it telling us? The sow does limit the amount of colostrum ingested by the piglets. So we need to try to increase the amount of colostrum that the sow is producing. So what are the factors from the sow side of things that could affect the yield? When people looked at the effects of age or body weight of the sow, there was no effect on colostrum yield. Gestation length, well, 113 days of gestation showed in a study greater colostrum yield than 114 or 115 days of gestation. Farrowing duration, no effect on colostrum yield. Parity, now parity, yes, it does have an effect. If you look at parities two and three in one study, they produced more colostrum than parities one or older sows. In another study, parities one, two, three produce more colostrum. And in another study, produce, uh, colo sorry, <laughs> sows from parities one and two produce more colostrum. So basically what you need to remember, the younger sows produce more colostrum. And this is exactly the opposite to what happens with milk yield because milk yield is greater in multiparous sows. So parity affects milk and colostrum yields differently. Litter size has no effect on colostrum yield on the first day postpartum. Another study, more recent, compared nine to 12 piglets, and there was no effect of that difference in litter size on their growth rate in the first three days postpartum, so no effect on colostrum yield. One thing that is very important relating to litter size is that the amount of colostrum ingested per piglet decreases by 22 to 42 grams with each extra piglet. So when we have these nice hyperprolific sows, we have a problem because each little extra piglet above six piglets will ingest less colostrum. What's the role of the piglet in itself in terms of colostrum ingested? Well, birth weight, the role of birth weight is not really clear. There's some contradictory evidence in the literature. One thing is sure is that the global vitality of the litter seems to be important. Authors seem to agree on that. And this is relating to the birth to suckling interval. The shorter time it takes for the piglet to suckle after birth, the greater colostrum yield. So again, this is related to vitality of the ligger. The more vigorous the piglets are, the sooner they will get up and suckle the mammary gland, and the sooner they will get colostrum, and this will in, in fact increase colostrum yield. Hormones affect the amount of colostrum produced. The whole process of colostrogenesis is controlled by hormones. Right before parturition, there's a big peak of prolactin. I've done a study where I inhibited that peak, and what happened? Well, all the piglets would have died because there was no onset of colostrogenesis. So that peak is essential for colostrum and milk to be produced. When you combine the peak of prolactin with the decrease in progesterone taking place at the end of gestation, those two hormones together lead to the onset of lactation and also producing the production of colostrum. Interestingly, with these two hormones, it was shown that if you have a greater ratio of prolactin to progesterone in the blood of the sow 24 hours before parturition, this is related with a greater colostrum yield. So yes, hormones in the sow can affect the amount of colostrum produced. What do producers do that can affect hormones around parturition? Well, farrowing induction is one great example of this. We often use prostaglandins to induce farrowings. And could this affect uh, the amount of colostrum produced? If you induce farrowings with prostaglandins on days 114, there's no effect. On day 111 or 113, there's a tendency to decrease yield. But if you do this earlier, so day 109 of the 
of uh, gestation. There's a 32% decrease in colostrum yield. So you don't want to induce farrowing too early in gestation. Colostrum composition is affected by the status of the junctions that are present between mammary epithelial cells. You see here the junctions, the space between the mammary epithelial cells. On one side, you have the sow blood, and during colostrum production, the spacing between these cells is large, so the tight junctions are not tight, so that IgG and other large molecules can go from the sow blood to the colostrum. As lactation advances, these junctions become tighter, and the big molecules will not be able to pass between these cells. It was found in goats, in rodents, and in cows that if you inject a very high amount of oxytocin, it can alter the permeability of these junctions between the mammary cells, hence the composition of the early milk. And that has never been shown in cells, but there is no reason why it wouldn't be the same thing in cells. And in fact, in pigs, this would be most important because if you give an extra 15 mil of colostrum to a small piglet in the first four hours after its birth, it will increase its amount in immunoglobulin G in its circulation, and it will decrease its mortality. So I'm going to cover here a project I've done asking myself, can injections of a high dose of oxytocin in the early postpartal period prolong this phase of colostrum production by altering the status of the junctions between mammary epithelial cells? We use second parity cells, divided them in two groups. So oxytocin uh, in one case, where animals received 75 international units of oxytocin, and control animals receiving saline. The animals received four injections in total, two per day, morning and afternoon. And the injection started between 12 to 20 hours after birth of the last piglet. We standardized letters and weighed the piglets on a regular basis. We also injected the sows on days 80 and then the booster on day 95 with ovalbumin. Why did we do that? To increase the antibody titer in the sow blood against this antigen, and then to see if in our treated animals, there would be a greater amount of this antibody that would be in the colostrum when we treat the animals with oxytocin. So we took milk samples, uh, day two, and farrowing was actually day one, so that's 24 hours after farrowing. Morning, afternoon, then days four and five, took the standard composition, and also at sodium and potassium. Why? Because the sodium to potassium ratio will give you an indication of the status of these tight junctions. The more sodium there is, the more space there is between these mammary cells. Okay, let's look at the results. You can see here on the horizontal axis, the day of lactation, where we took the sample of milk, and on the vertical axis, what we measured in the milk. If you look on the right-hand side first, fat percent, lactose percent, no differences between the treated and the controls. The treated animals are in blue, controls are in pink. But if you move on the left-hand side, on day two, remember the farrowing is on day one, so day two in the afternoon, the animals had received one injection of oxytocin, already significantly more energy. If you go in the bottom left-hand side, significantly more protein also. And if we move on here, you can see on the right-hand side and the top, sodium-potassium ratio significantly increased. So after eight hours of having received an injection of oxytocin, large amount, the tight junctions remain open, so sodium to potassium greater, so more room for big molecules to pass. And you can see this when you look at the bottom, IGF-1, which is a growth factor, a large peptide, it will still pass, so eight hours after the injection, there is more of this growth factor in the lacteal secretions. On the top left-hand corner here, you see IgG, so immunoglobulin G, significantly increased eight hours after the first injection. Also on the right-hand side, IgA are also increased, but there's less of IgA in terms of concentration in colostrum. And at the bottom here, interesting, 
the specific antibody that we raised in the cells against ovalbumin, you can see here, day two in the afternoon, eight hours after the injection, yes, it is greater in the lacteal secretions. Now, how about the piglets? If you look at body weight, they started with a similar birth weight. And at any time where we took measurements, there is no difference in terms of body weight between the two groups. However, let me remind you, we only used 10 liters in this case. In my mind, 10 liters is not enough to be able to say if growth rate of the piglet is affected. You would need a larger amount of liters. On the other side, when we looked at the mortality of piglets, the number of pigs born was similar in the two groups, but there was a tendency for a greater incidence of mortalities occurring in the control animals compared to the oxytocin animals. So this is something that is most likely even more important than the growth rate, the fact that there could be an improvement in terms of survival of these piglets. What can we conclude? One injection of 75 international units of oxytocin in early lactation, yes, it can prolong the colostrum phase. And we've seen this through an increase in sodium potassium in the milk within eight hours of injection. This leads to beneficial effects in terms of the quality of milk in early lactation. It will increase protein, immunoglobulins G, immunoglobulin A, and specific antibodies, like in this case, uh, the antibody against ovalbumin. All this suggests passive transfer to piglets, which is prolonged through this treatment. Now let's move to the second essential role of the sow for piglets, the production of milk. When you look at the production of milk by sows, you realize that they produce more milk than cows on a per kilogram basis in terms of body weight. So somebody may say, What's the problem? She produces a lot of milk. No, there is a problem. The sow is not producing enough milk to sustain maximal growth of her piglets. If you take a baby pig and on top of the milk it's consuming, you take a bottle and you give it artificial milk, that piglet will grow more. So it's telling us the piglet has the capacity to grow more than from the milk, the milk the dam is providing. If you look at milk yield in past years, yes, there has been an increase in milk yield. You know, we've done our job. There was good selection, but then it's remained pretty stable since 1998. But what do we have? On the other hand, we have had greater success in increasing litter size. We have a, what I call a new problem of hyperprolificity. It's not a problem for me because it gives me a job because I have to make sure that these piglets get enough milk because the amount of milk ingested per piglet has actually decreased. So how can we go about increasing sow milk yield? Wish it would be as easy as this picture, but no, it isn't. <laughs> There's a lot of factors affecting milk yield. There are sow factors. I will just name them here. I don't have time to go through them, but genetics will have an effect. Breed will have an effect. Parity, I already discussed this. Litter size, stage of lactation, suckling interval, all these factors have an effect on milk yield. Now there's factors that come from the environment. Outside factors get, can also affect sow milk yield, such as photoperiod, ambient temperature, you don't want it to have any heat stress, continuous high noise, which may be bad in terms of nursing behavior, hormones, nutrition, all these factors can affect milk yield. But one factor has not been considered too much un since until, I mean, about 15 or 10 years ago, and that one is mammary development. And it makes a lot of sense to look at it. Why? It was found in 1991 that the number of cells that secrete milk that are present in the mammary tissue at the beginning of lactation is a major factor that limits milk yield. It makes a lot of sense. The more cells you have that can synthesize milk, the greater your capacity to produce larger quantities of milk is. So this is important. Also, there's a correlation that was found between the size of a mammary gland and its milk yield, which was measured by the weight of the piglet nursing that teat. 
And these authors have concluded a wonderful, you know, by a wonderful statement, replacement guilt should be managed so as to enhance the memory development. But yes, how do we do that? So I could talk to you about another hour just about that topic. But today, what I will select is just a small component of that. First, you need to know, when does mammary gland development take place in pigs? When you look at a piglet at birth, it has a very poorly developed mammary duct system. Then you have three stages of rapid mammary development. In pre-puberty, starting at 90 days of age to puberty. In the last third of gestation, starting at 90 days of gestation to farrowing. So the number 90 is what's important in terms of timing of memory development. And then you also have development in lactation. Very important to know that it's only during the periods where you do have memory development that somebody can do anything to try to stimulate it. I always say three times zero gives you zero. There's no sense trying to use hormones or nutrition to stimulate memory development when there is none to start with. So it's during those periods only that we can try to stimulate the development. Again, there's many factors that can influence memory development, physiological status of the animal, hormones, nutrition, management, sucking intensity. And today I will focus on two projects dealing with one aspect, which is that of suckling intensity or use of a teat. I've asked myself the question, what is the possible impact of a non-use of a teat in first lactation on its milk yield in the next lactation? Is it important or not? So what I've done is a study where I've blocked either the same teats during parodies one and two or different teats during parodies one and two, so that in the second parity, piglets suckled either teats that were used before or not used before. So you can see this here in lactation one, we had an average of 14 functional teats. We always blocked the rear ones because they're difficult for piglets to access. So of the other ones, we blocked two on one side, two on the other, and then we also considered front, middle, and rear position on the mammary gland, of the mammary glands. So we took into account position and side of the glands when blocking them. And then in parity two, what did we do? We either blocked the same teats. So piglets were now nursing a gland that has been used before, or we blocked different teats. Now the piglets are using or are nursing from glands that were not used in the previous lactation. And in that second lactation, we used six piglets per litter because there were six teats. We used piglets of similar weight, good piglets. We did not want the piglet to be making any difference. The difference actually only came from the fact that they were using a teat that was used or not before. When you look at the results in parity two, you, you look at the weight of the piglets. On day two, the, uh, there was no difference, which is good. It's the beginning of the trial. But then as you go on, day four, seven, 14, you look at the difference between these weights of the piglets and the difference keep getting, keeps getting bigger and bigger. And on day 56, you actually have 1.12 kilogram more in terms of body weight of piglets that are suckling a teat that has been used before. So now I can tell producers, yes, it is important to have a teat suckled in the first lactation if you want that teat to produce more milk in the second lactation. And interestingly, if you look at the difference in weight gain of the piglet between days two and four, and remember, farrowing was on day one, so that's as of 24 hours after farrowing, you already see a significant increase in gain and body weight gain of these piglets. What is it suggesting? That colostrum yield is also improved. So use of a teat increases milk yield, but it may very well also increase the amount of colostrum produced. Now this leads to the second question. Okay, now I was all happy telling this information to producers, and first hand I had raised in the in the room was yes, but do we need the teat to be used for the whole first lactation for that teat to produce enough milk in the second lactation? Excellent question. So I did a project asking myself the question, what is the minimum time that a teat has to be suckled in first lactation 
in order for its milk yield not to be decreased in second lactation. So in first parity, we divided sows in three groups according to lactation length, two days, seven days, 21 days. Second parity, everybody had a 21 day lactation. We had 12 piglets for 12 teats and we weighed the piglets on a regular basis. So now when we look at the weight of these piglets, you see length of lactation one, either two days, seven days, 21 days. Weight of these piglets from day two to day 56, no difference. Some of my scientific friends may tell me, boy, Chantal, those are boring results. That's a horrible study. <laughs> and I will answer, it's completely the opposite. Those are wonderful results. What is it telling me? It's telling me it doesn't matter if I go above two days, seven days, 21 days in first lactation, the teeth being used, doesn't bring much more improvement. But two days is the minimum amount of time that the teeth needs to be used in first parity for it to have an adequate milk yield in the next parity. Now I come with my conclusions from all these. Ingesting 250 gram of colostrum is essential for the survival and growth of newborn piglets. If they don't ingest that much, they will not grow. The amount of colostrum produced by sows is very variable, and the sow is actually limiting the amount of colostrum ingested by the piglets. So we need to attempt to increase colostrum yield. There's a lot of factors that will affect colostrum yield. Some of these are animal factors, either sow factors or piglet factors. Hormonal status will affect colostrum yield. And one thing that is important for producers is the timing of the farrowing induction. You don't want to induce farrowing too early. So day 109 is too early for induce, uh, inducing farrowings. Now, vigor of the litter is important because it will decrease the interval between birth and suckling. And this is most important in large litters. So in fact, anything you can do to assist newborn piglets to go to the other as soon as possible will be beneficial for them to consume more colostrum. Recent results have shown that with one injection of a very high dose of oxytocin, 75 international units, in that early postpartum period will prolong the colostrum phase and will improve the quality of early milk. Now, if you look at milk yield, the sow, again, limits piglet growth because she's not producing enough milk. Enhancing mammary development, yes, it will lead to an increase in milk yield. So this is something we do need to look at. Suckling of a teeth for two days after birth in first parity is important for its milk yield in second parity. So if you have animals in first parity that are very thin and you don't want to leave the whole litter on them because they will lose too much body condition, yes, you can remove piglets. Please wait on day three if farrowing is day one. So you need to wait a good 48 hours before you remove those piglets from the sow, but then it will be okay. Now I want to thank you for having listened to me virtually to this presentation. And I want to mention that if you want any more specific information on the gestating and lactating sow, I've edited a book that was published in 2015 and which is available from Wageningen Academic Press. I'm not saying this to make money. I'm just saying it in case it's useful for you. And also more recently, just in 2020, I've edited another book with the same publication, uh, publication house. And now this one is more specific on the suckling and winged piglet. So if you have any interest, please go ahead and look at these books. And I just want to end also by saying that the job is not finished when the piglet is weaned. And it's also important to best assist the piglets after weaning. And this is something that will be covered by the next speaker after me. So thank you again. Thank you.